Landowners' interest in forest management often include realizing future revenue from timber production. In fact, many timber landowners manage their forests as an investment or as a business. Thus, if timber revenue is of interest to you, then it's worth spending some time to understand financial considerations. Mississippi State University Extension Service offers a six-hour short course on understanding forest management as an investment. But in this video, we will focus on some of the highlights. Much of what we will discuss are the methods that professional foresters use to make management recommendations to landowners when managing forests for future revenue is a primary objective. When timber production is a primary objective, foresters often use an even-age form of forest management. As the name implies, trees in the stands of that forest are of the same age. They are planted and managed to produce valuable timber products. Typical timber products that would be produced over the life of a timber stand or rotation include pulpwood, chip and saw, and saw timber. When we talk about trees that can be cut to produce these products, they are often described by a term called DBH, or diameter at breast height. As indicated in the diagram, this measurement is taken at four and a half feet above ground. The actual range of DBHs by product category can range depending on the forest product mills in your area, but generally they range from six to nine inches for pulpwood, 10 to 13 inches for chip and saw, and about 14 inches and above for saw timber. Another way to think of the three primary product categories as depicted here are small, medium, and large trees. Obviously, the larger trees are worth more and it takes longer for trees to grow into these product categories. Also, trees with few to no limbs in the first 16-foot log section make the trees more valuable for lumber production, as limbs translate into knots in lumber, which makes the lumber produced less valuable. So the fewer limbs, the better. Thus, in even age management, we plant more trees than we intend to have at final harvest at the end of the timber rotation when we will harvest our more valuable saw timber sized trees. This forces trees to self prune their lower limbs making them more valuable over time. This series of figures demonstrates the concept of planting more trees initially which will be reduced by thinning. Thinning is an intermediate harvest method where some trees are harvested to make room for other trees to grow into the more valuable product categories. Uh, the trees or seedlings are planted in rows at a predetermined spacing. After several years from planting, this can range from, and this can range from 10 to 15 years. Let me stop there. After several years from planting, and this can range from 10 to 15 years, the planted trees will grow to a size where the trees begin to compete with each other and fight for light, water, and nutrients. The growth will begin to slow, and that is not desirable. So a logging crew can perform a thinning and in this case, a first thinning to reduce the number of trees per acre. Often this is achieved by removing entire rows. In this example, every third row was removed. In addition to removing an entire row of trees, the weaker and suppressed trees in the remaining rows are removed, favoring those trees that exhibit better growth in tree form. The trees that are removed in this first thinning will be of pulpwood size. After the first thinning, the remaining trees will be allowed to grow for a number of years. At some point after first thinning, the trees will grow to a size where they will again begin to compete with each other. Thus, it may be necessary to conduct a second thinning. At this point, the trees will be of chip and saw product size. Your forester can help you make this determination of thinning time and intensity. By intensity, I mean how many trees to remove. Now, after the second thinning, the stand may be ready for final harvest. Thinning are largely determined by biological criteria, while the final harvest stage is largely a financial decision. To demonstrate, consider a typical loblolly pine plantation. The trees that you plant will grow faster or slower than other plantations, and there are many factors that impact growth rates of pine plantations. But one of the most important ones is site quality. How productive is your land for growing trees? We measure that using SI or site index. Your forester can help you determine the site index of your land. The Natural Resource Conservation Service can also help you understand the site index of your land. SI or site index is largely determined by soil properties. Now in this example we are looking at a pine plantation with a site index of 100 base age 50 
which means this site is capable of producing dominant trees that are 100 feet tall in 50 years time. This equates to a site index 70, base age 25, which means the best trees would be 70 feet high in 25 years. Some reported site indices are in base age 50 and others are in base age 25. It's important to recognize that there's a distinction based on base age. This figure demonstrates one of the tools used by professional foresters to make thinning recommendations. Trees per acre and SDI, or stand density index, as we discussed earlier, trees increase in size and become too dense, which can slow the growth. The SDI formula is a tool that foresters use to determine when to thin, how many trees to remove, and how many trees to leave so that no growing space is wasted. Here, 600, 681 trees per acre were planted and only 80% survived after the first year. And this figure SDI criteria indicate that a thinning was necessary at age 15, so the number of trees per acre was reduced. SDA, SDI also indicated the need for a second thinning at age 25. So remember, the decision to conduct a thinning is based on biological criteria. Now, when will we conduct the final harvest? At what age? Your forester will provide you with a discounted cash flow analysis of your pine plantation, and that will include a projected future final harvest age. That future final harvest age is based on financial criteria. And two of the financial formulas often used are NPV or net present value and LEV or land expectation value. We will discuss both in more detail in a moment, but notice that the financially optimal final harvest age increases with stand age and then peaks and declines. Obviously, the financially optimal harvest age is the one where LEV peaks. Once your pine plantation approaches that final harvest age, you should pay particular attention to the timber markets and follow timber price reports. If timber prices are much higher than the recent average, you may choose to harvest a few years sooner. Notice that in this example, the site index is 60, base age 25, meaning that the best trees would be 60 feet high in 25 years. Notice that NPV peaks near $350. This is a site index 80. Its NPV peaks well above 700. So you can see that site index can tell you much about the investment value of your land for growing trees. Now let's apply the financial considerations to a typical pine plantation investment scenario and see if it's an acceptable investment. Are we making more money over time than we invested and does it provide an acceptable rate of return? Here's the scenario. A landowner wants to know if planting a pine plantation to be harvested in 30 years, whether or not that's a good investment. Well, we need volume projections for the trees that we're going to grow. We're going to plant this in this scenario on a 9x9 nine nine spacing. We're going to plan on thinning it once at age 16, and we want to know what it's going to be worth by age 30. To evaluate forestry as an investment, we need some information. Sources of income. That can include revenues from thinning and final harvest, uh, annual lease payments for recreational activities such as hunting, uh, harvesting of pine straw and other non-timber products are also potential sources of income. We have to gather this information. And there's going to be cost, potential cost, regeneration costs, uh, timber stand improvement costs, and taxes. Now depending on the kind of forest management you practice and your desired objectives, you may have more or less sources of income and cost. It can be different for each landowner. To make money, it takes money. And the same is true in making money from growing trees. Establishing a new forest involves some costs. Tree planting, seedlings, site preparation expenses, etc. This article, published every two years in Forest Landowner Magazine, uh, is a good source of information and it provides average costs for forestry practices across the South. It's a real good resource. Another cost estimate resource sp specific to Mississippi, let me start again. Another cost estimate resource specific to Mississippi is the reforestation tax credit form. And on the second page are average reforestation costs incurred by the Mississippi Forestry Commission. This is available on the Mississippi Department of Revenue website. We also need estimates of future timber revenues. Revenues involve two parts, product prices and product volumes. A professional forester can help you estimate future timber volumes using forest growth and yield simulators. 
For prices, we can use timber price reports to estimate average prices over time. There are a number of timber price reporting services such as Forest to Market and Timber Mart South. A Mississippi statewide average timber price report that is updated quarterly is available on the Mississippi State University Extension Service website. That's msucares.com. Now we don't know what timber prices will be in the future. So when conducting a financial analysis, it's better to use an average of prices over time. Here is an average of pine product prices from 2004 to 2012. Timber prices, as you can see, tend to cycle over time, and that is one of the reasons why we use an average over a period of time when evaluating the investment value of growing trees. Ideally, we can time our final harvest with a period when prices are trending higher. Now let's return to our 30-year pine plantation investment scenario. Using our sources of information, we have estimated the following cost and revenues. Cost includes site preparation prior to planting, seedlings, and actual planting. And we also include an annual management cost that will accrue each year. A typical annual cost would be property taxes. We would also estimate future timber revenues from the thinning and final harvest. So if we spend $158 to establish the pine plantation and $5 per acre per year for 30 years to realize revenues of $500 in year 16 and then $2,800 in year 30, here's our question, is this a good investment? Well, a professional forester uses a set of financial formulas to answer that question, and we will review those and their application to this scenario. But first, notice that I've placed each of the costs and revenues on a timeline so I can keep track of when each cost and revenue occurs. It's very important to remember that money has a time value. One of the ways we account for the time value of money is by using a discount rate. That $2,800 final harvest revenue is not worth $2,800 today, is it? You know, what would you rather have, $2,800 right now or wait 30 years? Obviously, you'd rather have the $2,800 now. So the present value of that $2,800 uh, will be much less. And one of the ways we account for that is by considering the time value of money. And interest rates allow us to do that. But it's also useful in making certain that we earn a minimum acceptable rate of return on our investment. So how much could you earn if you were to invest your tree planting money elsewhere? Uh, you could use that rate of return as a discount rate in evaluating the investment value of planting trees. So once we have estimated our costs, revenues, and we know our discount rate, we can then apply the financial formulas to help us value the pine plantation investment. Interest rates also allow us to account for risks associated with our investments, and forestry involves some risk. Uh, this can be addressed by using a higher discount rate, a rate that is higher than our less risky alternatives, but comparable to those alternative uh, rates of return. So what interest rate should you use? Well, it varies for each landowner. You should consider alternative uses for your money, or the rate you would expect to earn on similar investments. In this example, we will assume a minimum acceptable rate of return of 6% for this investor. Here are four of the primary financial formulas that professional foresters use to advise landowners. We will look at all four in detail. I mentioned two of these earlier. That was net present value and land expectation value. The other two you may be seeing for the first time are equivalent annual income and rate of return. Now using your sources of income and cost, you can perform these calculations to evaluate your forest, forestry investment. And your investment can then be compared with alternative investments. Net present value is a very common investment calculation and it's not unique to forestry. NPV is the difference between the present value of all cost and income at a, at a given interest rate. The formula is simply the present value of all revenues minus the present value of all costs. A positive NPV indicates the investment furnishes a higher rate of return than your selected minimum acceptable rate, and thus it's an acceptable investment. If NPV results in a zero value, then your investment equals your selected uh, required rate of return, and it's also an acceptable investment. Obviously, a negative NPV would mean the investment is unacceptable at your selected rate of return. Now let's apply NPV to our pine plantation example. The first step is to discount all of our costs and revenues to present values. 
When we do that, the present value of all revenues is 684.33 and the present value of all costs is 226.82. Let's look at how each cost and revenue is converted from a future value to a present value. The formula we use in this simple present value formula, which we will apply to both the thinning and the final harvest revenues that are expressed as future values. The formula we use here is the simple present value formula, which we will apply to both the thinning and the final harvest revenues that are expressed as future values. So we have the thinning at age 16 and the final harvest at age 30. We know the future value of the thinning at age 16, which is $500. We'll insert our interest rate, which is 6%, and N is the number of periods or the years that it takes to reach that future value, which is 16, and we apply the present value formula, and we get 196.82. We do the same thing with the final harvest revenue at age 30. Plug in that value of $2,800, our interest rate of 6%, and the number of periods is 30, because it takes 30 years to reach the final harvest value and apply the present value formula, and the present value is 487.51. So the present value of all revenues is 684.33. That's the $196.82 present value of the thinning at age 16, and 487.51 present value of the final harvest at age 30. So the present value of all revenues sums to 684.33. Now let's consider the two costs. The stand establishment cost is already expressed as a present value since it occurs at the very beginning of the investment. However, we have to discount the $5 per acre per year annual management cost. The formula we use is the terminating annual present value since the annual cost terminates at the end of the rotation. So we use this formula and plug in the values. Our annual cost is $5, our interest rate is 6%, and the number of periods is 30 because it's a 30-year investment. And do the math, and it comes to $68.82. Now, with all costs expressed as present values, the present value of all costs sums to $226.82. Now that all cost revenues are expressed as present values, the net present value for the pine plantation investment can be calculated. NPV equals the present value of all revenues minus the present value of all costs. So NPV equals 684.33 minus 226.82, which is 457.51. So the estimated net present value for this forestry investment is $457.51 per acre. Now calculating net present value by hand may seem a little daunting, so try using this online forestry investment calculator called ForVal, which stands for forest valuation. It was developed by researchers here at Mississippi State University. You select the financial criteria, the type of calculation, which in this case is net present value. Select that from the drop-down box. And then we have to enter in each one of our costs and revenues. We'll start with our revenues, which is a single sum, $2,800, occurs at year 30 and then click Add Revenue. We'll do the same with our thinning revenue of $500 per acre at year 16, and click Add Revenue. And then we'll include our cost now. We have the $158, which occurs at year zero, because that's the beginning of the investment. Click Add Cost. And then we have to change the cost revenue type to Terminating Annual, and then enter in the cost amount, which is $5. It occurs at the end of year one and concludes at year 30, at the end of the investment period, and thus it's terminating annual, and click Add Cost. Once you do that, you can click the Calculate button, and we have some prompts here. We're asked for our interest rate, which is 6%. Click OK, and it returns the result, net present value, 457%. 51. Much easier than calculating that by hand. Now let's talk about another useful investment formula. Equivalent annual income. It's the net present value of an investment at a given interest rate that has been annualized. Annualizing the NPV of an investment is useful to compare or rank investments of different lengths. It can also be used to compare a forestry investment with other land uses such as agricultural crops that generate income each year. 
The inputs to the formula for calculating EAI are the NPV value of the investment, your discount rate, and the number of periods, which is the number of years it takes to reach the final harvest age. In a moment, I will use the four-val software to calculate the equivalent annual income for our pine plantation investment scenario. Rate of return is another useful formula for evaluating forestry investments. It's the rate of compound interest earned by the funds invested. It can also be described as the average rate of capital appreciation over the life of the investment. You can relate this to the net present value calculation we just discussed because rate of return equals the minimum acceptable rate of return where NPV is zero. Another way to think of rate of return is it's the compound interest rate that equates the present value of all future incomes with the present value of all future costs. The higher the rate, the more money you are making on your investment. The manner in which you calculate rate of return depends. It's a very simple process if there's only one cost and one revenue. It's a very straightforward calculation as you can see from the formula. For investments with more than one cost or revenue, it requires an iterative process to estimate the interest rate that equates the present value of all revenues with the present value of all costs. One more word about rate of return is that it's useful in accept reject decisions. However, it's not recommended for ranking investments. We use other formulas for that. Now let's return to Forval and use it to estimate the equivalent annual income and rate of return on our 30 year pine plantation investment. From the drop down menu on type of calculation, select all of the above and then click calculate since we already have our revenues and costs entered into it. And we're prompted for our interest rate, which is six. So enter six and press OK. And it returns the results. And there we have our rate of return, the net present value we calculated previously. There's the equivalent annual income. Earlier, we looked at a graph that showed net present values and land expectation values over a range of possible final harvest years. And if you recall, there was a certain age when that value peaked or reached its highest possible value. Let's now talk more about the LEV formula. LEV estimates the value of bare land used for growing timber. It's essentially a special case of net present value that considers all revenues and costs involved with timber production for an infinite series of identical rotations for even age management or cutting cycles for uneven age management. The way you would interpret LEV value is that it's the maximum amount an investor should be willing to pay for bare land and still earn an acceptable rate of return that would be equal to the discount rate used in the LEV calculation. The formula differs from net present value in several ways. One is that LEV assumes an infinite series of rotations, thus it considers the value of future timber growth, allowing for a more meaningful comparison of management regimes of unequal time periods. So you can compare many different timber management scenarios for your land and the LEV formula will indicate which is most profitable. The LEV formula then can be used to rank investments when evaluating alternative rotation age links or management regime options. You will sometimes find the LEV formula called by different names such as bare land value, soil expectation value, and Fossman's formula named after Martin Fossman who first published the formula back in 1849. Here's a look at the LEV formula. You will notice another major difference between NPV and LEV, and that is that the formula uses net future value and not net present value. So what that means is that all costs and revenues have to be compounded to the future value at the year of final harvest, unlike net present value, which discounts everything to the present. Again, I is the interest rate and N is the rotation age in years. So the final harvest age is the value of n. The formula can be computed for a range of possible final harvest ages, and the age where LEV is the greatest is the financially optimal final harvest age. Here we have the LEV formula being applied to the 30-year pine plantation scenario. We compound all the values to the end of the rotation and express it as future values. The final harvest value is already expressed as a future value, so it doesn't have to be compounded. Once that is done, the net future value is computed. Take the net future value at the end of the rotation and apply our minimum acceptable rate of return on this investment, which is 6%, and the year of the final harvest or rotation, which is 30, and the formula returns a value of $553.96.
Rather than calculating each of the future values by hand, we will use for value to calculate LEV for us. So under financial criteria, select the type of calculation, which in this case will be land expectation value. And earlier, we already entered in all of our revenues and costs. So I click calculate and I prompted to enter in my interest rate, which is six. And then it asked me for the rotation length, which is the time of the final harvest, which is 30 years and click OK. And it returns the result. So some rounding error here and different from the value I computed by hand by about a penny. But how do we interpret this value of $553.95? That value is the most that a landowner should be willing to pay for bare land that could be used for the 30-year pine plantation investment scenario, given our assumptions about cost and revenues. Of course, bare forest land goes for a lot more than that, doesn't it? So that tells us that those that are buying forest land today find value in owning that land above what timber income would justify. There are many reasons and recreational benefits are one example. Now we've looked at several formulas. So which one should we use and when? Well, it depends on the type of analysis that we're conducting. Accept reject investment decisions, ranking acceptable investments, or valuation of forest-based assets. When trying to decide whether or not to accept or reject an investment decision, any of these compound interest formulas can be used for that purpose. Each will indicate either acceptance or rejection of an investment. Recall our 30-year pine plantation investment example? Well, given our required rate of return, each of the formulas indicate that the investment is acceptable. NPV and EAI are both positive, and the rate of return is much greater than our minimum acceptable rate of return of six. So it's an acceptable investment. When we are trying to rank acceptable investments, we can use either NPV, EAI, or LEV. So in trying to choose between competing uses of your investment dollars, use NPV, EAI, or LEV. NPV is the best financial criterion for ranking investment projects of the same time length. EAI and LEV are specialized forms that can be used for ranking investment projects of equal or unequal time length such as land use alternatives, either ag or forestry, timber rotation links, either 20 or 30 years or some range in between, timber management regimes. How many times should we thin our pine plantation? What's financially superior? The formulas will provide answers to those questions. Here's an example of using land expectation value to choose between management regimes. In this scenario, we have a site index 70 pine plantation that was planted at 681 trees per acre. I've estimated cost and revenues. I also identified the financially optimal rotation length for each of the two management regimes, which include a no thinning regime and a one thinning regime for three different minimum acceptable rates of return. We can learn several things here. First, we can see that it is better from an investment point of view to thin the stand at least once since the LEV value is greater for the one thinning option. When I applied a discount rate of 4%, I found that the financially optimal rotation length was 32 years for the no thinning management option and 35 years for the one thinning management option. So of the two options, the one thinning has the higher investment value because the LEV is greater. We can also see that the minimum acceptable rate of return or discount rate, when it increases, the attractiveness of the investment declines and becomes unacceptable for this scenario somewhere between six and 8%. So it's possible for an investor's minimum acceptable rate of return to be so high as to make an investment unacceptable. Since we talked about timber price reports earlier, I would like to finish up our discussion with some caution on using those reports. Timber price reports are not based on a representative sample of every timber harvest conducted in a given region over a specified period of time. Rather, the price reports are based on volunteer reporting from harvest on timber tracks in the region. So it's important to keep in mind that there is no average track of timber that is harvested. Some timber tracks are easy to access and are adjacent to a major highway, while others are difficult to reach and require obtaining right-of-ways across property owned by others and not easily accessed by a major road. So the cost to harvest timber can vary greatly from one timber track to another, and that affects price. 
Also, some buyers of timber have greater needs than others, and that varies frequently. So that can have a big influence on the price offered for timber. The point here is do not use a timber price report to determine the price of the timber you are selling. Timber price reports are useful to understand price trends over time, for conducting financial analysis and planning, and for estimating basis value for income tax purposes. So should I use the timber price report values when selling my timber? Absolutely not. The prices listed on the timber price report are not the prices you should expect to be paid for your timber. You may be offered more or less, and that depends on a host of factors. Remember also that reported timber prices are historical information. They're not current. Also, certain factors may cause a particular tract of timber to be valued higher or lower at any given point. For example, a tract that has a high timber volume per acre and can be logged during wet weather times of the year may bring a higher price per unit than the average reported in the timber price report. A tract with less volume and greater distance from the buyer's mill may bring less. Additional factors that affect timber values are timber quality, tract size, type of product to be made from the timber, access to the tract, and many others. Prices contained in the MSUcares.com timber price report are a good price reference for landowners who wish to market timber. However, individuals should have their timber evaluated by a professional forester before making a timber sale. And that's the best way to determine what your timber is worth and what it should sell for. The forester will help you market your timber and help you obtain the best price the market will bear by having multiple buyers bid on your timber. To find a registered forester, you can visit the Mississippi Board of Registration for Foresters website. Again, the Mississippi State University Extension Service offers a six-hour short course on understanding forest management as an investment. There are many other important topics that we did not cover in this video, such as conducting an after-tax financial analysis and accounting for inflation. If that is of interest to you and you'd like to learn more on these topics, please contact your local county extension office or you can contact me. Thank you very much.